Great. Right. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Bahman, for inviting us to this. Um, we have a panel of three speakers making four presentations today. The first one will be my topic on how we've applied or learned from forecasting methods from other public health programming for pharmaceuticals, uh, the challenges that it included when it came to COVID-19 and what we've learned from it and what we're implementing under a new initiative that then Wendy will speak in more in depth about. Then Batman will talk about a data cohort that we've given him from Kenya and how he's applied it to new methods for forecasting. We'll end the panel back to me again to talk about not vaccines in particular, but how we've used global data sets to forecast for manufacturers and procurements for public health goods and how that can then be applied to vaccines in a new format. So we hope you enjoy um, the presentations and do ask the presenters to introduce themselves. You already know Matt Bahman, but he can do it again should there be new folks on Zoom who join us and um, you're gonna time me, right? And okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so my name is Leila Kluge. I work with John Snow Inc. It's an NGO that gets um, donor funding to help lower and middle income countries with a number of supply chain management work is the center that I work under, but we do a lot of other global health um, technical assistance as well. My background is as a pharmacist, uh, but I studied uh, public administration and then went on to do a micromasters in supply chain management and have been working in forecasting for about two decades now of work. And so a lot of this, um, once I started working on COVID-19 vaccines a year ago under a new Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation activity, I tried to take those experiences and try to figure out what was happening with the vaccines that maybe could be improved. So as I mentioned earlier, just going to review those methodologies from other programs, um, talk about how they're different from what the vaccine world had been doing and what we can learn from them and benefit um, from those approaches and what drives the vaccine forecast versus the other forecasts. And then briefly discuss the new initiative uh, where we're trying to adapt those lessons learned to the new realities of what's happening in the vaccine world. And so um, what we have historically um, done is under supply chain management technical support that a lot of donors give usually runs through siloed programming. So the and there are a list of the donors that usually provide this kind of funding through different mechanisms of NGOs and INGOs who help support the countries where those products are procured through. So a lot of times the HIV AIDS, when under President Bush, he created an initiative called PEPFAR. It's a president's emergency relief for HIV AIDS where he was procuring antiretrovirals, came with assistance to provide supply chain management support to those countries who were getting those medications. Similarly with malaria, there's a president's malaria initiative, and then the Global Fund helps support both of those things through global fundraising programs. And then for contraceptives and family and sexual goods, it's usually through the UN FPA, uh, Population Affairs, and USAID as well. And then um, TB programming, historically, a lot of USAID, again, this is the US aid organization, and then the Global Fund and the Global Drug Facility that does a lot of procurement of those supplies for TB medications. Historically, UNICEF, which manages the procurement and the negotiations for vaccines, has been siloed over the years. And you see USAID is an underneath that donor group who provides that support. Although there's a lot of programming support that USAID does in terms of training um, and providing guidance and programming and implementation of vaccine programs, US agency governments have not done the procurement of those vaccines. And, and so the supply chain technical advice that has come along with the procurement of those goods didn't follow. And over the last two decades, the other programs have evolved quite a bit in terms of how they've been doing their forecasting for those goods, whereas UNICEF has remained siloed and hasn't adopted, oftentimes because it wasn't really necessary. And we'll talk about why the differences are that way. Um, the, traditionally, 
the other forecasting methods for those other first three programs that we talked about. Um, use an you know, 18 to 24 month horizon. Their output is leads to a procurement plan uh, for the procurement purposes. And that's why the donations really affect you know, wh whether or not you get TA because they're doing the procurement for those products. They wanna make sure they have accurate numbers to negotiate with the manufacturers and suppliers for. Um, there are opportunities to do longer horizon for fundraising or advocacy purposes, but they don't feed into the procurement plan. Um, it's typically a aggregate national level or an aggregate uh, program for HIV AIDS, for example, that's done um, and then fed to those donors and three main methods and how we in our global health world refer to them are the demographic based. So it's using the population figures and disease patterns to identify what the needs of those users would be. It is a consumption base of what you guys are probably more familiar with, logistics data and actual products that were consumed and used. And then the service base, which is looking at what is the provision of services, what is the pattern of provision of services historically, and what does that say about the future needs? And so, um, the result of those forecasts then go into this supplier demand planning process where the inventory um, is reflected, looking at your minimum and maximum inventory practices and doing the procurement for those products for that year, year and a half to two years out. Because of the funding cycles from the donors, this is traditionally done with very long timelines probably as from a lot of your experiences, procurements are done once a year or maybe divided out two or three times across that year. Long buffer stocks are kept in stock. Um, medicines usually have, other medicines other than vaccines have two to five years of expiration. So it's okay to order that much and keep them in stock. And uh, planning decisions then are monitored and revised based on actual consumption that comes in. So on a monthly or quarterly basis, someone usually within a Ministry of Health is responsible at revising and resetting their inventory levels once a month, and then looking at their next procurement that the forecast was based on, making the necessary changes for that minimum buffer stock that would be required, which is normally measured in a month of stock. So keeping certain months of stock in order to be able to meet the forecasted demand. And um, so those three methods have uh, provided really valuable feedback for the data systems that are in country to provide the necessary information to be able to use these forecasts. And there is a kind of a feedback loop for the development of the HMIS, the health service information system and the MIS, uh, L LMIS, which is the logistics management information system. And as both of these, the methods for forecasting have evolved, so have the information systems that cater and gather the information for them. And the assumption, so a lot of judgment-based forecasting goes into this because two of these methods really actually forecast the users rather than the products themselves, right? And so when you're forecasting your users, you are placing a lot of judgment on who you think they will be based on population figures that are only updated once a decade. And then there's a growth pattern. You are assuming some information on the disease patterns, the ability for that person who fits those two profiles to then come in to receive services. Do they have access to a trained provider who knows to give them the right services? Um, are they going through the public sector? Because it's the governments that we're usually working with, not through the private sector. And are there trained staff? Is there adherence to that treatment for long-term chronic, for example, medications and diseases? And then is there political and financial support to make sure those procurements actually go through, right? So we can, we can forecast a demand, but does it actually follow through for us to be able to place the order for that medicine that's gonna sit in a warehouse and needs to go down the supply chain to meet those needs? And I think some of you are gonna to speak to further about combinations. So when you do those three forecasts, you end up with three different results. And 
Uh, in some forecasts, yes, you can have a range, but for this kind of particular forecast, we need to place a procurement order. So we can't rely on a range. You have to decide on a final figure that then you're gonna place through the donor to have something come and be shipped into the country to be placed in the warehouse. Usually this is a multi-stakeholder committee that comes with various background of either the logistics warehouse person, the person responsible for financing, the person responsible for treatment and care who understands if national treatment guidelines will be changed or not in the future and that affects what you are going to purchase or not. And they review the quality of the inputs of the data from this, for these three different forecasts. Uh, a determination is made either one of them is the strongest or not, or maybe you think maybe two of them are strong and you wager and hazard a guess that's somewhere in between the two and you pick an average or something. Really simple ways of, of forecasting. Then when that one single figure is assumed, it goes and be, uh, is placed in the supply plan uh, where inventory and, and months of stock levels are determined to place those shipments. So now let's review what happens in vaccines. You've seen the standard. What has been the traditional uh, method for vaccines? Now vaccines until COVID-19 uh, in these lower and middle income countries are for children under five years old. Their basic set, they don't change. It's a rote process. It's a, it's a non-volatile patient cohort that comes in and gets certain vaccinations as an infant until they're five years old, and then they're out of the system. The demand is somewhat guaranteed. You know who the clients are. The birth rates don't change often without some kind of political or social instability. And so simple methods worked for forecasting for vaccines historically. Um, and procurements for them were once a year through UNICEF. UNICEF provided the technical advice. They used one method, which looked at the cohort of the babies being born, divided it by 12 to figure out what a monthly demand would be. And um, other methods were not normally used. The forecast, and this is an interesting factor, actually included the buffer stock as part of the forecast rather than it being part of planning process that would happen afterwards. So 25% buffer is normally added to the final demographic based forecast. The planning for it again, didn't use a lot, utilize because there was no planning process because that 25% was built into the forecast and a once a year shipment was made dividing it by 12 uh, to review how you were doing, there was no review of traditionally, now there are differences with some countries, looking at what do we have in our warehouse and how long will that last? So months of stock analysis or having an inventory management protocol that said we should keep at least two months for this level of the supply chain and at, at most you know, this much so that we are reducing our risk for expirations. It was really not part of the planning process. You were just receiving the total divided by 12. And then the actuals were actually part of, weren't coming back into the system to tell you where you were. It wasn't really necessary. And because of the goal of the forecast has been did we cover all the babies that we thought we should cover to limit disease um, uh, patterns expanding in country? They were looking at, at the second graph down here as a cumulative total of consumption and use over time and not looking at this upper graph over here, which looked at month to month patterns of consumption. The goal wasn't to look at the demand trajectory changing, it was to reach a total in the program of babies who are vaccinated or children under five who are vaccinated. And the logistics data, then a lot of the reports that we're seeing now through the systems to try to do COVID-19 don't allow the users to be able to detect patterns of use. It's much harder to look at this bottom graph right? And to see what's happening when there's a campaign, when the rate of vaccines increase versus this top one over here and looking at your average consumption, maybe perhaps rolling average consumption over time. And more so, you know, I think I talked about some of this, so I will skip ahead. 
to the challenges. Initially, as you well, are well aware and globally, supply was not available for some of these lower and middle income countries. So there wasn't even an opportunity to forecast. You, didn't, you weren't given what was, what was not in supply. When the supply became available, decisions from COVAX and Gavi and others who negotiated with those manufacturers for those vaccines decided to e equitably distribute them based on population and coverage goals. So they didn't take into account the capacity of the system to provide those vaccinations, which included cold chain storage, especially ultra cold chain storage for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, disease patterns, access, demand for the population, training of the providers, and even the data systems that were there because those data systems were created for childhood supported vaccines. And so, um, this demand and assuming the demand from the adults really bases the, it on their perceptions and of the risk, right? And their ability to come in and want to have the vaccination. Um, products could not be supplied annually, right? There wasn't enough. And so countries were being contacted to say, COVAX has this amount and uh, are you willing to accept it or not? Really, and really the not part wasn't initially in the first year being communicated. It was like, we have this much, it's coming. And so the countries in lower and middle and the global south were just accepting them as they were coming in, not knowing, not being able to evaluate them, how long they will last, not knowing what their patterns of consumption were, not being able to determine whether or not stocks that they were being taking in were going to expire or not. And so this inability of the structures that were created for children were not working for COVID-19 vaccines. And so I know I ran through that, but there's probably an opportunity to ask questions or talk later, but we have been funded through the Gates Foundation for the last year to try to take a crack at how do we, working with a lot of our global partners who work with ministries of health to um, strengthen immunization programs, how do we introduce some of these other methods to them? So looking at, instead of reporting out as an aggregate, reporting monthly so that you can visualize and see your data patterns of consumption. Um, and to be able to then use that to predict how long your supply will last so that you know when the next order or shipment should be made. And, um, and all of that requires new indicators and new uh, visuals in their HMIS and LMIS systems. And if they don't have that yet, giving them a tool to be able to do that with. And um, being able to predict expiration of the products that they've received. So being able to document their shipments and uh, putting in the expirations where our um, tool will help, help them predict what the anticipated expirations will be based on this rolling average consumption that's coming in and the first expiry first out rule. Um, we are also doing something whereas if you're not collecting consumption data, which was not being of good quality within a lot of the systems for vaccines because they're relying on demographics, they haven't created a system that uses consumption data and so it wasn't really important to keep good quality consumption data. We're forcing our users in those programs to have to account for everything that was used. You can't just reset your beginning balance and not know what, where that product went. We're having them account for, was it used for doses in arms? Was it administered? Did it get wasted? Because these products are multi-dose files. Once punctured, only lasts for a certain amount of hours. And if they don't get used, a certain percentage of that product is wasted. So if you can't account for that, or you can, if it wasn't transferred or damaged or expired, the ending balance should equal that simple calculation through time in a month. And if it doesn't equal, then you're, we don't have quality data to use. And so we're creating processes where that is being flagged for them. If it doesn't equal out, you need to find out where the quality of your data is, where there is a gap, and strengthen that so that you're using and applying the correct consumption information so that we're not then applying that for a future forecast. Um, 
and enabling while we're doing this working through our organizational partners enabling the ministry of health to then be in a better position to respond to global partners and other countries who are donating their vaccines to these lower and middle income countries to decide whether or not they actually need them which products they want and how much of those pro donated products they should accept so that they use them in time and not have to deal with um, news articles that say X country, for example, just expired a million or two million vaccines because they didn't get them into arms. It may not be because of an action that they made, but rather donations sometimes being dumped into their countries. And the successes currently, even though we're in for about a month now, is that a lot of those indicators and processes that were being introduced are now being recognized as something not just for COVID-19, but something that the countries themselves have approached us on in incorporating them into their current HMIS and LMIS systems so that they can utilize it for all of their other vaccines. So it's, it's a hope and, and a success story for us so far, you know, optimistically looking at that and seeing that this, this improvement hopefully will have long-term standardized effects for all other vaccines. So I will pause here. I think I have three minutes maybe for questions and answers and welcome um, anyone should they want to ask questions. Elizabeth. Okay, I will repeat your question. So my question is really about what your recommendations are for the future epidemics or pandemic that we're seeing with some of the monkeypox starting to come up and we know there's going to be a future pandemic. What are your best recommendations for not just for the COVID vaccine, but from what can we learn going forward for the next time we have to quickly roll out as a global vaccine? So that is, um, so the question is, um, what have we learned through this process for future global vaccines? And that's true, it's not just monkeypox, but there's a malaria vaccine, right? Which would probably not just be pediatric based. For now it is a pediatric vaccine, but eventually there's HPV, which is a teen uh, vaccine being rolled out. There's other vaccines, HIV AIDS with the new platform of Moderna and Pfizer, mRNA should there be an HIV AIDS vaccine in the future? And so the kinds of things that we are recommending is, is moving away from that demographics-based forecast to an actual recording of the demand for those forecasts, right? So it's really strengthening the information systems that can provide us with the best value data to use for that feedback into a forecast. So what we've seen is like the aggregate over a year doesn't doesn't help you you what you really need to understand is your weekly daily or monthly consumption of a product without that you really can't do a lot of the forecasting methods that we're going to hear about you know you can't do time series you can't do exponential smoothing you there there isn't much more that you can do there's a lot more judgment based assumptions around a demographic based forecast and the type of forecasting we're doing is really practical, right? It's not uh, disease patterns or epidemiology. It's for a procurement. It leads to actually buying a product that is going to sit in a warehouse. Are you using your financial resources for an inaccurate forecast that's not going to get used? And having actual used data in a segmented time series will help you do that. Did that help? Okay. Yes, sir. I was surprised that um, other vaccinations, such as flu or shingles, did I know they could use this as well? The question is whether or not other adult vaccinations like influenza or shingles make it in these systems. And pneumococcal, another one uh, for the elderly. Yeah, I have not seen it. And Wendy? Um, I've not, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
It's just your food shop before you can have a tablet. That's what you're doing. Yeah. So Wendy's comment, not normally seen. And right now we're trying to look at the product lists for other vaccines. And out of the 275 versions of all the other you know, vaccines that are available through UNICEF's catalog to procure, I think I only sell one or two for influenza, not seen pneumococcal in there, and I haven't seen shingles. I've seen um, chicken pox for children, again, but not the shingles. Yep. Um, not sure. Okay. Yes, Brian. Um, you mentioned that uh, when you're doing the right forecast based on shows uh, like graphics, um, it was forecast based on uh, how how granular is that data? Like, do you have that time series, for example, for each thing in your country? Um, normally, so, yes. Yeah. Yes. And actually, so the question is, do you have granular data on the number of doses and vials being used down to the facility level? And Batman's data, actually, uh, he, will you talk about this a little bit more? Yeah. So, yes. And normally in most systems, that is. Now, the diff, the, the, what changes is, is it paper-based up to the district level? Is it mobile phone entry up to a district or a regional level and then goes into an information system that's electronic. And some of that over the last two decades has really moved to an electronic based system where there's less faxing and calling in and more the Google Sheets or mobile technology base or even online base that uh, will connect and upload when they have internet use. So yeah. So WHO and UNICEF and Gavi through COVAX have been very insistent on making sure that they do have this information. Now, country by country, the quality of that is questionable, right? But it is a required request from them to the countries that participate to collect the information on who has been vaccinated. Right, so like from the first vaccine. Yeah. So most of the March is some of the earlier shipments that we see to LMICs. March, 2021, yeah, okay. And I don't see any hands raised here, but if we have time, we can come back to any questions. Okay, oh, yes. So they weren't actually doing any forecast. So when there was no supply, they didn't have any reason to forecast for. Um, and then when they did started getting supplies, it was rather, we have 400,000 of AstraZeneca and countries often, when we started working on this project last summer, we were told they didn't even know that they could say no. And so giving the first example was we gave Niger an opportunity to see their data disaggregated with our colleagues who work there and uh, presented to the logistics committee reviewing the COVID-19 vaccines and said, you know, it looks like your pattern of use has been about 400,000, even with your campaigns. And all of a sudden, with that new data point, he said, well, we already have 1.2 million in stocks. That means we have three months. I can say no to the next shipment because I don't need it until I can get through this supply. But without knowing that his average consumption was 400,000, only looking at an aggregate of what they'd done, he couldn't compute those two figures together. So when we first started working and giving some of those data points to them in a different way than they were seeing for themselves in their own data systems, they started making decisions about rejecting things that they couldn't use in time. 
So no, there was no forecast historically to compare to see for accuracy. Okay, I am going to get off so that others can.